welcome everybody. Uh, we'll wait just a moment as people settle into their Zoom boxes and, and then we'll get started. You're at the Silver Hill Hospital Grand Rounds program. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Dr. Jeff Katzman, the Director of Education at Silver Hill Hospital, and we are just delighted to have you join us where we're privileged to welcome our very own Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz Schwartz, who will be presenting on the topic social media use in adolescence. And I have the really great honor and pleasure of introducing her in just a moment. And is our as is our custom, I will attend first to a little bit of housekeeping. Our next Grand Rounds will take place on October 11th, where we will welcome Dr. Wendy Lichtenthal, who will be presenting to us on uh, Finding a Lighthouse in the Sea of Grief, Applications of Meaning-Centered Grief Therapy, which should just be really a terrific presentation. Back to today's lecture, your questions are, as always, a critical component of our Grand Rounds. And I will moderate a Q&A discussion with Dr. Ortiz Schwartz at the end of her lecture. This is really a great opportunity to put forward questions and comments to Dr. Ortiz Schwartz, which you can submit at any time during the lecture by using the Q&A box. A key component of our Grand Round series is providing no-cost continuing education credits. If you wish to receive CME or CEU, please kindly complete the evaluation survey that will automatically show in your browser when we end the webinar. We will also email a copy of the survey to today's participants. And finally, disclosures. No planners of this activity have indicated a relevant financial relationship with an ACCME defined ineligible company whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. And the drum roll, it is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz Schwartz. <clears throat> Dr. Ortiz Schwartz is the team lead in the, on the inpatient adolescent unit here at Silver Hill Hospital. She is American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology certified in adult and child and adolescent psychiatry. She completed her psychiatric and child and adolescent training at New York Medical College and maintains clinical faculty appointments in the Department of Psychiatry at New York Medical College and Yale. Dr. Ortiz Schwartz draws from her academic and clinical experience in her extensive work with children, adolescents, and their families to address a variety of clinical conditions and concerns through the developmental life cycle. Personally, I wanted to say what an honor it has been to get to know and work with Dr. Ortiz Schwartz. We've built up a training program here on our campus, and she's the first person always to jump in to teach and mentor our trainees with tremendous knowledge and compassion and a collaborative spirit. So a big thank you from me to Liz for helping with our educational programming at Silver Hill and for joining us today to share your wisdom that's so important to so many of us um, that uh, and that so many of people uh, people have uh, signed up to listen and learn from around the country. So uh, Dr. Ortiz Schwartz, I'm going to turn to you. Um, thank you again for joining us and, and everybody out there, please uh, get your questions ready and send them, send them in as, as they come to you. Well, good morning. I am Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz Schwartz. Thank you very much, Dr. Katzman, for this wonderful introduction. Um, today, I will be discussing a very topical issue, which is social media using adolescents. Um, and I will attempt to shed some light on its impact on the current crisis in mental health for teenagers. I will begin, however, by disclosure, I have no actual or potential, conf potential conflict of interest in relation to this program or presentation. And the objectives are to describe the various types of social media and how they specifically um, affect adolescents' moods and behaviors, to identify when social media use becomes problematic and um, understand uh, the um, contribute to disorder use and behaviors, and to define strategies to assess and support teenagers and their families in managing their social media, media use. 
So first I'd like to start with a question to the audience, which is what percentage of adolescents use social media in the United States? And to have you think about it a little bit, um, you know, the numbers are pretty staggering. Um, it is about 95 to 97 percentage of adolescents that use social media in the United States. So it's pretty much universal. Uh, what percentage of adolescents in the United States struggle with mental health challenges? And that number is has increased. It used to be about one in six individuals struggled with some form of mental health challenges. Right now, about one in every three adolescents, about 30% of adolescents is struggling with some mental health challenges. And there are some specific populations, some populations uh, that struggle even more. And we'll talk about that. But first, let's talk about um, what is social media. Let's define that a bit. So social media is a collective term for websites, applications that focus on communication, um, community-based input, interaction, content sharing, and collaboration. So this is very interesting because interesting to me because I used to think of social media just as, you know, Twitter, for example, you know, now called X or Instagram and so forth, um, Facebook. Um, but there are other things that are considered if there's creation uh, involved, such as, um, you know, YouTube, that is considered to also be a way, uh, a, a, a social media. So I want to start a little bit with the history. Back in 1997, the first side was created was six degrees dot uh, com. Uh, which people could post a web page and describe a little bit about themselves. Then in 2000, an application was uh, started hot or not, where people would post pictures and then um, strangers would rate them on their level of attractiveness. Then Friendster came in 2002, on 2003, MySpace. And then between 2003 and 2005, you know, that we had an explosion of Facebook, LinkedIn, Flickr, WordPress, YouTube, Reddit. Um, and then on 2006, Twitter, now X, um, started. 2007, Tumblr, 2010, into Instagram and Pinterest. So a lot of, you know, visuals, uh, pictures and so forth. And then in 2011, that's where Snapchat started with uh, things like disappearing posts, posts would disappear after 24 hours and some of the, you know, filters where people would put, you know, all sorts of, you know, rainbows and things like that on their, uh, on their pictures, as well as Twitch. Uh, 2013, Slack and Patreon. And then 2015, there was another revolution, which was Meerkat and Periscope were the ones that started live streaming is now standard on many applications. So more, more videos. 2017, we have um, TikTok. And, um, you know, and right now we have differences in how adults and teens use social media. So let's talk a little bit about that. So since uh, the 2014, 2015, TikTok has become much more um, significant uh, compared to Facebook. Facebook. So you see that, for example, YouTube, about 95% of teens um, ever use um, YouTube. Whereas you go after uh, to TikTok, then Instagram, Snapchat, um, Facebook is lower. Whereas if you look at adult population, Facebook continues to be higher. And then you go continue through um, ones that are seldom used. Um, according to uh, Monitoring the Future, which is um, a survey that is funded um, by the um, Center for Disease Control and the NIMH, is as of 2021, 8th and 10th graders now spend an average of 3.5 hours per day on social media. And that's social media alone, that does not include gaming or other um, types of um, computer use for homework, et cetera. Uh, and that's an average. And again, this is part of Monitoring the Future, which has been around for you know, many um, years and they survey 8th and 10th and 12th graders um, every year to see how, if they're engaging in problematic behavior, substance use, and so forth. Um, according, to, according to the Pew Research, um, these are kids that are, um, by description, um, utilizing YouTube on a daily basis. About 77% of those kids surveyed are using YouTube on a daily basis, TikTok 58%, uh, and so on and so forth. But of those, about 19% 19, 19 of them 
say that they're using um, YouTube almost constantly. The same for TikTok, 16%, Snapchat, 15 and Instagram, 10 So there's a, a good number of kids that are using it almost constantly, and also a large uh, number of kids that are using it several times per day. Um, in the same Pew research, 54% uh, of kids say that it would be hard for them to give up social media, either somewhat hard or very hard. Um, so generally, um, it is a concern for kids to be able to give up social media for any considerable time. Um, teenagers feel that um, it affects them. Uh, and for some of them, they feel that it does not affect them as much personally, but it affects their peers. So looking at this slide uh, in more detail, you can see that um, some kids feel that it only affects them negatively 9% of the time, uh, neither positive nor, ne nor negative 59% of the time, and that is mostly positive. But they also feel that for other people their age, they have mostly negative interactions. So their views on how much kids feel like um, social use, use has affected them versus how it affects their friends differs. Um, in terms of individuals that are affected more, we know that there is a gender difference and this were um, done particularly for males and female, boys and girls uh, rather. And uh, for that, um, there were some individuals, the girls that said that they had more, felt more connected to what's going on in their friends' lives. Um, and that was 83% of girls versus 76% of the boys. Um, others said that they, they feel like they have a place where they can show their creative sides. That also is um, slightly with the girls, 77%, with the boys, 64%. They also feel that um, people, they can find people that can support them through tough times. That's again, 72% of the girls, 62% of the boys. And 61% um, of girls versus 54% of boys feel like they're more accepted. So this is a total number of teens that are feeling positive experiences through, um, you know, through um, interactions with social media. In terms of negative experiences, um, about 45% um, percent of the girls that were surveyed um, feel sometimes overwhelmed because of all the drama compared to 32% of the boys. Um, they feel like their friends are leaving them out of things. So that fear of missing out is very present in a good number of those girls compared to the boys. Uh, they feel pressure to post content that will get a lot of comments or likes, um, as, and also they feel generally worse about their own lives. So I think that it's a, con a concern that 28% of those kids, sur kids surveyed feel worse about their lives after um, interacting on social media. So in terms of um, race and ethnicity, uh, roughly about eight in 10 black teens, about 81% say that they use TikTok compared to 75, 71% of Hispanic teens and 62% of white teens. So there's a difference in terms of to total usage based on, um, on race, race. And uh, Hispanic teens, 29% are more likely than black or white teens to report using WhatsApp. So what are some of the positive effects of social media? Well, some, according some, to some teenagers, this is our sites that are for teens by uh, teenagers. Uh, some of the positive um, you know, aspects are that it helps in growing social support network of peers and find helping, help making personal decisions and forming opinions. So there's a sense of, sense of connectedness. Also, they report connecting with others on social media can help decrease feeling of isolation, which is particularly important for kids that are uh, marginalized, whether it is you know, from you know, ethnic minority backgrounds, whether it is from LGBTQ plus uh, background, or you know, in particular during the pandemic where kids were having less face-to-face uh, -face interactions for periods of time. Um, on the positive side, they cite that using social media can help teens explore interest and personal identity, can give teens opportunity to try new hobbies, develop skills, and explore passions such as artistic, academic, or advocacy interest. Uh, interest. So a lot of kids learn how to, you know, play guitar and you know bake and do other things of that nature, and they see that as a positive, um, as well as be more aware with um, social justice um, uh, themes, etc. 
Um, additional benefits that are uh, reported are that social media can help teens stay connected with friends who live far away and connect with people based by interest, not necessarily by geographic location. So they're connecting with people, you know, all over the country and sometimes all over the world that have similar um, interests. Um, they also um, say that being active on social media can help developing with uh, personal and professional skills, participating in advocacy, leadership efforts, finding internships, job opportunities, and applying to school. So those are some of the positive things that are um, generally reported. Let's talk about some of the concerns with teenage social media use. Um, on May 2023, the Surgeon General issued a new advisory about the effects of social media use on youth mental health. Um, and I just want to emphasize how unusual that is because, you know, the CDC is busy with, you know, pandemic and so many other concerns, but because this has been an issue that cannot be ignored, how is social media affecting mental health youth uh, for, for uh, teens? I think that required an advisory. So they have uh, something that's available online, can be um, found and read, has all, all the information related to the advisory. Um, but I will just, you know, describe, you know, the, the overall conclusion, which is that more research is needed to fully understand the impact of social media. The current body of evidence, what we do understand right now, shows that it may have some benefit for some children and adolescents, and there are ample indicators that social media can also have a profound risk of harm to the mental health and well-being of children and adolescents. So again, there are some individuals that uh, may have some benefits, but there are a tremendous number of kids that are showing some signs of being effective negatively. So according to um, the Division of uh, Adolescent School Health, which is DASH, that's CDC um, Division of Adolescent School Health, there are associations with social media use and increase in anxiety, decrease in acquisition of social skills, which we saw again um, anecdotally throughout the pandemic, the kids were struggling in terms of bonding and, and making some, some connections to a more mature level. They also noted that there's, there's an increase in bullying and that it can have poor mental health outcome in certain sets of teens that are, are often seen as marginalized. Um, how much is too much social media? So there was a study um, conducted with you know, 6,500 adolescents in the US, uh, ages 12 to 15, and that adjusted for kids baseline mental health. So they were able to you know, understand where they were to start at the beginning of the, um, of the assessment. And they noted that kids that are spending more than three hours on social media face double the risk of experiencing poor mental health outcomes, including symptoms of depression and anxiety. Therefore, there is a concern of you know, increased mental health difficulties with uh, increased time of use of social media. Um, there was an, a study done in college age youth so again, this goes after adolescence, but for those um, teenagers or, or actually uh, college age kids, uh, they started rolling um, an introduction of social media platform throughout the different colleges. And so it was, it was a new experiment. They rolled out the platform and they actually noticed that the kids that were exposed to that particular platform where the kids could communicate with each other, had an increased uh, reported level of depression, about 9% of them had, you know, over the baseline, uh, and 12% of, of um, increase in anxiety um, over the, the that period of time. So ultimately, um, some differences were noted when this um, social media platform was, um, so it started. So let's talk about that. So we talked a little bit about social media and I wanna move a little bit about the crisis in the teenage mental health. So according to the Youth, youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, which is um, a CDC study that's done every other year or so since 1991, um, just based on students aged 12, nine to 12th grade, they've collected over time data on 5 million students since they, in, since they started in 1991. And they include things like demographics, health behaviors, and different conditions, 
They talked about, you know, sexual injury, violence, bullying, diet, physical activity, obesity, mental health, including suicide and substance use behavior. And they started collecting data on social media use over the last um, couple of years. So in terms of the uh, number of kids that were struggling with sadness and hopelessness, 42% of kids uh, were struggling with some degree of sadness or hopelessness. That doesn't mean that they were diagnosed with a mental health condition, but at least one third experienced diagnosable mental illness, typically depression, anxiety, as well as other things. So again, 42% of kids are feeling consistently sad or hopeless, and you know, 29% ex you know, are experiencing clinically clinical levels of, of symptoms. In 2021, more than one in five students seriously considered attempting suicide, and about one in 10 students, about 10% of our um, high school kids attempted suicide. So again, according to the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, these feelings were um, to be more common among LGBTQ plus students, female students, and students across racial and ethnic groups. So about 45% of LGBTQ plus students seriously consider attempting suicide, which is far more than the heterosexual students. And black students were also more likely to attempt suicide than students of other races and ethnicities. So again, some subsets of populations have even a tougher time with uh, mental health. And according to DASH, which is part of the CDC's Division of Adolescent and School Health, in 2021, 57% of female students experience persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, which is up from previous years. For LGBTQ plus students, 22%, uh, and again, I have to backtrack a little bit because the 22% involves um, LGB and uh, students, but does not quite uh, involve trans students in this particular research. Um, but with LGB uh, students, 22% have attempted suicide, which is up from previous years. And of LGB uh, youth, about 16% have also in the research um, experienced some sort of sexual dating violence, which is an increase. About one third are bullied at school, nearly twice as others um, to use illegal drugs, and 47% have seriously considered suicide which is you know, raising a tremendous alarm that our LGBTQ plus um, students are struggling significantly more than their um, non-LGBTQ plus um, teens. Um, during the pandemic, the youth emergency department visits um, increased tremendously. Uh, in one particular study um, that reviewed uh, insurance claims for um, how many kids were going into the hospital, they reviewed 4.1 million insurance claims for teen, for kids ages 5 to 17. And they noted that the first year of the pandemic, the numbers of emergency room visits for mental health actually decreased. And I think the assumption is that people did not want to leave their, um, you know, their quarantine and, or go chance being in a medical hospital. Um, but after the, um, the quarantines, I'm sorry, after, um, um, you know, in, in the second year of the pandemic, um, there was a 6.7 increase from baseline of kids presenting in the emergency department. Um, our, if, you if you separate that, the teenage girls had a, a, a bigger chunk of that number than previously. So 22.1% of the emergency visits for mental health concerns um, you know, were, were higher. Uh, and among those teen, teen girls, there was a 43.6% of those that were presenting to an emergency room with some level of distress, anxiety, and whatnot. Um, a lot of them had uh, presented for suicidal ideation, a suicide attempt, or self-harm. So that's a tremendous increase from pre-pandemic levels. Also, inpatient admissions overall increased and they were lengthier than in pre-pandemic uh, years. And the other phenomenon is that kids that were boarding in an emergency room because there were no beds available increased overall 27.1% the first year and 76.4% the second year for teenagers ages 
13 to 17. So basically the second year of the pandemic, the kids that were waiting to receive services likely in an inpatient hospital or some sort of outpatient intensive program uh, increased dramatically. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there were also some noted um, you know, mental health concerns. And in one particular study that looked at brain development in adolescent, they noticed some changes as well. It is a very small study um, out of um, San Francisco, but uh, about 163, um, 163 adolescents ages 13 to 17 were already involved in a longitudinal study. So that means that they were being assessed over a long period of time. Half of them were assessed before the pandemic and the other half after the stay at home orders. And adolescents after the shutdown reported more anxiety, more depression and greater internalizing problems. That means feelings, feelings negatively about themselves, um, you know, more obsessionality, more negative um, behaviors um, towards themselves. But also interestingly, they had some MRIs um, and they showed that the parts of the cortex, the brain cortex that showed uh, involvement in planning and self-control were thinner compared to the kids that were uh, that had the MRIs done before. So again, these were an even number of kids that were um, you know, randomized to do one or the other, but compared to the kids that were done the had the exams earlier, the kids after the pandemic had again more anxiety, more depression, and they also had some changes in the um, MRIs, uh, including reduced volume in the parts of the brain that have to do with accessing memories and the part of the brain, the amygdala, that has to do with regulating response to fear and stress. These changes are typically seen in individuals that are you know in teenagers and others. Um, that have experienced longer term trauma like wars and other kinds of things. So it is um, just um, something of note. So again, so I first spoke about, you know, social media as a concern. I talk about mental health in uh, United States teenagers as a concern, but I'm gonna try to link that and see what research studies show us in the relationship between social media use and adolescent mental health to see what kind of, um, trends are um, shown. So in this study, um, social media use and depression in adolescents, a scope and review, um, there are a lot of really uh, helpful data. Uh, in the United States, depression diagnosis in youth increased from 8.7 in 2005 to 2000, uh, in 2000, you know, to 11.3 in 2014. So the numbers of depression diagnosis in youth were already increasing. Um, in, since the year 2000, there's been an increase uh, in 47.5 in suicide between the ages of 10 and 34. So that, you know, I know that that doesn't cover just the teenage years, but generally suicide, in that population has increased and now is the second uh, largest cause of death in that age range, secondary to accidents. The prevalence of depression and suicide has coincided with an increase in screen related activities, including social media use. And this is really key because um, this particular author, um, Jane Twenge has um, written a lot. She has not only looked at the prevalence of depression and this cross section, but she has looked at how you know individuals, teenagers were rating their suicidality and depression in you know in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and above. So she has con continued to look at different cohorts, and clearly the differentiating factor uh, has has been the introduction of um, of screens, particularly and, and specifically social media use. Um, However, we don't have clear, complete, solid data just yet. There's just a correlation. When you start doing the statistical analysis, there's just an association between social media, media use and depression for some individuals. Uh, what is concerning is that whenever kids are using more um, social media, they typically tend to have higher levels of depression. So one of the uh, things that would be helpful for clinicians is to notice and counsel families and individuals that is not just the content, even though that is important, but it is also the amount of time spent uh, and association with higher levels of depression. So 
for one particular study um, found an association with suicidal ideation and attempts and high frequency of use. For that particular study, um, use over two more, more than two hours a day um, showed that those individuals have more likelihood of suicidal ideation and attempts. Another study didn't quite find that there was an association with depression, but it did also it noted that there's some um, deficits in self-regulation in things like impulsive behavior um, based on uh, increasing social media use. There was another study that um, showed that factors like the number of social media accounts, the frequency in which a person checks the social media, were also associated with depression. So it's not only the time, but also the intensity in which the person is checking and the actual numbers of social media account. Um, there were additional studies that suggested a bit of a give and take relationship between the quantity of social media use and depression. For example, in one particular study, the frequency of Instagram browsing at baseline predicted whether they were going to be depressed six months later. And if they were depressed at baseline, they also had, had a higher uh, chance that uh, at a time later they were doing more postings online. So again, it's not clear, you know, the chicken or the egg, what comes first, but there certainly is a connection between if a person is um, navig navigating social media and they already are depressed, that they may get more invested in it. And also that people who are using um, Instagram at a higher level, you know, six months down the line might have more depression than the peers that are not using um, as as much. Certainly having used, and, and again, I just have to point out that when uh, clinicians are doing those, stu those studies, it's hard to tease apart how much of it is screen use in general, how much of it is, of it is gaming, how much of it is social media. So they try to limit the studies to the things that have to do with social media. But in this particular study, they also uh, included more than four hours with gaming and social media together. But kids that were using heavy use, more than four hours of gaming and social media, they had more depressive symptoms a year later. Um, and there was another study yet that talked about that depressive symptoms predicted increased internet use overall and also decreased participation in non-screen activities. So we clearly see some of this relation. We don't have the you know, strong data to say the causality that one causes the other, uh, but there is certainly a very strong association between social media use and certain kinds of, um, you know, depression, uh, externalizing behavior, internalizing behavior rather, et cetera. Another study showed that uh, school burnout increased the risk for later, later excessive internet use and depressive symptoms. So if kids are reporting feeling like they're burned out by school, they also may tend to use more internet and depressive symptoms later. And there was at least one study that showed a small directional association that said, you know, if a person is depressed, they will use more screens. If a person is using more screens, they will become depressed. But when they were doing some of the final um, modes, their association was not very strong. So they couldn't say certainly this is a clear, clear connection. So it's more of a general concern. So there were other studies that did not find that use of frequency of use and depressed mood were associated. There was one study that said that instead of the amount of time, it is how important or how invested the person is with uh, social media. So if basically if they're using it less, but they just cannot put it down, they're very much thinking about it all day and really uh, worried about you know, missing out, that tends to have a poor arc outcome. With moderate social media use, the studies show that sometimes kids were able to have better emotional self-regulation. Um, and for there was also a positive association in one study, basically saying that social media and externalizing behavior, that means more acting out behavior, um, was seen, but they did not see the one with social media and depression. So I think the jury is out. There are studies that are still giving us little bits and, and pieces, but we still don't have a comprehensive picture. We just cannot say right now that social media blanketed causes mental health concerns in teenagers. And for some teenagers, especially when it's considered to be a moderate use, um, have a better emotional regulation. And I often get asked uh, how, much, how much is moderate use? There are some studies that suggest that about an hour 
a day um, is manageable. Anything more than three hours tends to be problematic. And that's usually for gaming. So it's not clear necessarily. We haven't figured out necessarily what is the, the, the appropriate um, number. And that will also vary by developmental age uh, and maturity. Um, in one study, older adolescents that had higher social media use had also more social competence, while younger adolescents that were using more social media had more internalizing problems, diminished academics and activities. So what this means is that for individuals that are using at a higher level, the kids that are younger tend to have more you know, problems in terms of uh, less academics, less um, non-screen activities, and more difficulties, more negative feelings about themselves, whereas the older adolescents could handle it a little better. And I think that 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 stands um, the, the fact that with more development, kids may have more maturity to handle even higher levels of social media use. Um, of the subset of kids that get into real problematic social media use, there were some that looked at uh, the patterns and some of the patterns included things like um, emotional um, maladjustment, internalizing and externalizing symptoms, depressive mood. And two studies found that depressive mood predicted problematic internet use. So again, once the kid have been identified to have addictive patterns, we can certainly see then the proportion of kids that are clearly um, showing mental health struggles. Um, the kids that have been noted to be profiled at risk in these studies for problematic internet use are usually female. They use the internet for longer periods of time than their peers. They have lower self-esteem and more depressive symptoms. Um, again, kids that are having social media use that's problematic and depression typically tend to have a lot of rumination, a lot of negative thinking, um, a lot of insomnia, which is partly because of you know, being addicted to social media as well as the depressive symptoms. They also tend to use um, social media late at night, which it impacts their sleep, increases their anxiety and depression. And also um, they may have more concerns around cyberbullying, both um, you know, being the victims of cyberbullying, but also perpetrating cyberbullying. Um, moving a little bit away in, in terms of gaming disorder, because there are some, you know, correlations. I think that for uh, gaming disorder, we typically see it more in males and also more association with anxiety, depression, ADHD, um, and, and so forth. Whereas um, you know, they tend to be disorders of impulsivity where the kids are just, you know, really, um, you know, very impulsive. And I think for social media, when we see the problematic social media use, we see that it's more, um, it, it's more around the clock. I think when, when, when kids are gaming, typically the boys are, are gaming, they're doing it in front of a screen, they're doing consistently. Whereas when the, um, you know, typically the teen girls are involved in social media, they're doing it consistently throughout the daytime, but it's less obvious. They're checking, they're stopping to do another activity. They check again, they go do another activity and so forth. And they get very worried about, you know, daily activity streaks and kind of keeping up with different things, but that doesn't happen all at once. It's not condensed. It's just happening throughout the day in, 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 in consistent fashion. Those are, those are the typical uh, patterns. Uh, what we see in clinical presentations, when we are here at Silver Hill and in other places, when I speak to colleagues, I think what we're seeing is, you know, kids that are coming in with a lot of distress. And I'm just going to give you a brief, you know, case example. So, you know, we may have Sally, it's a 14 year old adolescent female with ADHD, some history of moodiness, lives with mostly with mother. Um, occasionally stays with stepfather, uh, sorry, mother and stepfather occasionally stays with father, has had some history of bullying in middle school, and then presents with anxiety, panic, suicidal ideation, self-harm, some restrictive eating, some difficult peer interactions, a lot of rejection sensitivity, and some degree of cruelty from peers that online that has bordered on bullying. Um, avoid school, at times stays out late, um, stay in touch with friends who sometimes, um, you know, may uh, tell her that if she does not respond to their messages, that they're not going to like her, that they're going to ghost her or drop her from their friends group. 
Um, and, you know, gets up usually later and avoids going to school anxious before getting to bed the next day. Um, in the past has been triggered by online posts of people, you know, thinking that um, she doesn't have enough of a thigh gap, which is that when a person closes their legs, there's a little bit of space, which happens with pe when people are particularly uh, thin or having a lower body mass index. Um, so kids of normal BMI are exposing themselves when they're 13, 14, and they feel like that's the normal and they feel wrong for not having features like that in their body. Uh, this particular person was treated in the past with um, an antidepressant medication, but they stopped using it uh, because they felt that maybe they were going to gain some weight on the medication. Um, and they also feel very compelled every day to text three, to put three pictures on Instagram every day to keep a streak going because if they miss on that streak, their friends are going to be worried and they feel like they're missing out on something. So again, I'm just giving you a flavor of a presentation of an individual that comes in with, um, you know, with a lot of um, mental health concerns um, and a lot of concerns regarding the problematic use of internet in a variety of ways. Um, and I'm going to move forward as to why. Why are teens, teens more vulnerable to the effects of social media? And obviously they're going through developmental factors, including puberty. So a lot of the hormonal uh, factors, um, there are some things going on in their brain. There's neuronal pruning, pruning, which means that pathways are becoming more efficient. It's sort of use it or lose it. When kids are younger, they're learning about so many different things. But as adolescents, we have to get more efficient at those things. So the neurons are developing different pathways. There's a development in the cortical frontex, uh, in the in the cortical regions that have to do with executive functioning. That means self-control, organization, and other things that develops differently in uh, at different times for kids. And we know that even when kids are, you know, young adults up to the age of 25, there could still be some degree of cortical development happening. Uh, kids tend to need more sleep. It would be surprising to think that teenagers actually need more sleep than their school age um, siblings. And that is because of all of the, um, you know, uh, physical growth and, um, and brain development that is going on. At the same time, um, the puberty and adolescence is sometimes where we first start seeing diagnoses such as depression, other mood disorders, schizophrenia sometimes starts in adolescence, but we start seeing more of the major mental health disorders during adolescence. That doesn't mean that younger kids cannot get depressed, but we start seeing that um, you know, um, become more, more prevalent in teenagers and beyond. In terms of psychological factors of why kids are more vulnerable, there are various developmental tasks, and these are things that if kids are successful, they will go come and they will have better self-esteem. Things that shape self-identity, um, they need to learn how to begin forming and building relationships that are more solid and based on uh, relatedness, not just based on playing together necessarily. They need to start learning and being um, vulnerable to expressing themselves and being shut down and turned down by peers. And they need to learn about the world around them. Um, other psychological factors is that teenagers will begin this process of separating from caregivers so that they can become sufficient in their lives. Uh, and they start understanding better concepts uh, that are abstract, such as morality. Um, the other psychological factor in teenagers is that they see themselves as infallible. That means that they sometimes feel like another kid is going to get hurt if they drink and drive, but it's not going to happen to me. Another kid is going to have trouble if they stay up all night on you know, social media. That's not going to happen to me. So that's, that sense of uh, invincibility can uh, really play to some of the adolescent risk-taking behavior. The other concern has to do with accepting one's physical body and keeping it healthy. So teenagers need to learn about their body and how to, um, to keep it healthy. And when they see, they notice their own body changes, they haven't made the mental adjusted. They see this highly curated images in social media. Um, sometimes it creates some problems and this is not new to social media. We, you know, we've always had concerns in terms of media in general, magazines and other things of that nature, but it has exploded because so many people can post things and um, there is some body positive content out there, but it's minor. Uh, and by the time that teenagers are exposed, they're exposed to a tremendous number of highly curated images. 
In addition, other things that increase teens' vulnerability are susceptibility to social pressures, peer opinions, and peer comparisons. At this time in their life, um, kids become really much more influenced by you know, the peers and the world than their you know, families of origin. Um, that's when social comparison begins and in earnest. Uh, when you look at posts, you can notice that female posts tend to focus on appearance, uh, fashion, appearance, and so forth. And males are still trying to connect with each other and doing things that tend to, you know, kind of gross each other out or do each other in terms of, um, you know, silly types of behavior. Those tend to be the content of the things that are po um, um, posted. There tends to be peaked risk uh, taking behavioral behavior and exploring sexuality. And, and I'm not even going to touch upon, you know, sexting and other kinds of things. So those are different lectures, but these are some of the tasks that adolescents have to navigate. Um, in addition, we have another social factor, which is that this generation, Generation Z and um, beginning of the Generation Alpha, we're starting to see some of the, you know, 13 year olds, um, basically their entire lives have been documented on social media. You know, they, the younger kids have had a smartphone for as long as they can remember. Uh, smart for, smartphones, for example, started in two, 2007. In 2010, they became really uh, common. And by 2012, you know, pretty much everybody had them. Um, but even before that, you know, there were plenty of, you know, social media applications that with the intention of keeping in, in involved and keeping everybody, grandparents and everybody um, documenting, you know, kids milestones and so forth. So their whole entire life has been documented by um, social media. There are additional social factors that affect, um, you know, uh, that are important to make, that make teens more vulnerable, in, including um, racial factors and ethnicity. Uh, in terms of the process, why is the process, why are kids getting addicted in terms of the process? Obviously, we talked about the time spent. The content can be highly, highly engaging. Uh, there are minimal or very few natural stop cues. When you start, for example, a TikTok video, then you go to the next and the next and the next and the next. So it's not like a book, you know, you start, you know, one chapter or you end the book, you know, really there's just basically you could be on it forever. Uh, and some kids, especially when it ap appeals to their sense of emotion or then sense of, you know, of stress or anxiety or, or whatever social justice, they can continue and they stay on a topic or a, there's been a natural disaster. Some kids really get engaged in that pattern of, you know, what's, what's uh, called doom scrolling. Um, the other thing about, you know, social media that's being engaging is a false sense of safety. So a lot of teens tend to overshare. Um, and there's also this constant demand of intimacy and connection. Basically kids feel like they need to engage with their peers. Um, without social media, they interact with somebody and then they back off from the interaction. And we need that in order to be able to analyze our relationships and understand this, there's a constant need for, me, for being responsive to their friends. The other concern is that we miss out on body language facial expressions, vocal reactions, and the vulnerabilities of social interaction. So some kids feel that, you know, now calling on the phone feels too like it's too much. They're used to being able to be more thoughtful before they respond to, a, you know, uh, an instant message or something of that nature. And now they don't have those cues. And I think that a lot of, um, you know, a lot of clinicians and educators feel that that is affecting, um, you know, kids' ability to, um, to be more appropriately social and, 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 and be aware of social uh, cues. Some additional concerns uh, in terms of the, um, the process is that if kids are not exposed to a variety of different um, outlets, they may just get stuck with one idea and they're only hearing the echo chambers of, yeah, and that happens with adults as well, that they may just you know, hone on to one idea and be able to not look at other um, sources of information. Um, and it can be pretty easy to be cruel um, to others, um, especially for teenage girls. They feel that they're not able to, um, to directly disagree with a person without jeopardizing the relationship, but on social media, they're doing things that are even more outrageous or extreme in terms of jeopardizing their relationship. For example, ghosting each other 
or other things that can be eventually more problematic. So it tends to be a little bit easy to just, you know, shut down somebody than telling a, a person, a friend, hey, you matter to me, but what you did is something that I'm concerned about. And, and those are skills that the kids are not getting um, at this time. So in terms of the content, we know that there's a um, tremendous number of negative exposure and overexposure, harassment, blackmail, and cyber, cyber bullying and trolling. But 45% of kids have been exposed to some degree of at least as a witness or being part of these kinds of things. Um, concerns about their reputation, meaning um, potential blackmail, uh, violent or sexual content. And this number is worldwide, 29% of, you know, of uh, kids between the ages of um, eight and 18 have reported uh, seeing some sort of violent and sexual content online, um, as well as other you know, problems, risky contact, online meetings with strangers, sexual contact, risk for gaming disorder, risk disorder, media use, um, target or witnessing uh, violence or bullying, uh, certainly age inappropriate content, and also the concern about high profile suicides and that how, how that is handled um, in terms of having pages that are um, you know, glorifying or actually memorializing a person that has died from suicide. And the United States media tends to be careful. Like if a person has died from suicide, they don't publicize it because of the concern about potential contagion. And there's less of that happening in some of the online, um, uh, sphere and the social media sphere where anybody can post a, um, you know, a memorialized page and how that might affect a person that's um, contemplating suicide and feeling, oh, this is how people are going to remember me and maybe sometimes romanticize it is a concern. But again, we've had concerns about media contagion since, you know, since the days of, you know, the romantic poets and, and um, you know, um, and earlier uh, concerns with Romeo and Juliet, Juliet and so forth. And then there's concern about, especially for teenagers in terms of, are they gonna be able to discern from misinformation, hoaxes and other challenges? So that those are things that are quite problematic that the kids are exposed to. Um, moving on, um, again, some of the clinical observations, some of the things that we see very briefly in our experience is that after kids spend some time away from their phones, it's a little bit of almost uh, almost like a withdrawal period. And then they start taking their time to understand how does social media affect them in their lives. Sometimes it takes in therapy and in groups, the, the noting of how better they feel, how better they're sleeping, how their mood, mood improves. And that's in addition to treating their mental health underlying condition. But we notice that kids start playing again. They start enjoying nature again. They start enjoying movement and physical activity sometimes. So it's really wonderful to see that, um, you know, in our inpatient and transition living and other teams that we work with here. So moving into the, the aspect, so what can we do about, you know, the mental health crisis, crisis in adolescence? What can we do about social media? And it begins uh, for us, many of us clinicians, um, to include social media in clinical assessments, finding out how much the person is on social media. And sure, they may underreport, but it gives you some ideas which platforms they're involved with, how many social media accounts they have, um, you know, how long they're on it, how long they're checking, uh, the patterns, especially try to understand how much they're using at nighttime. Do they take breaks? Are they still using social media during school time, even though it's a lot of schools have restrictions for that? Um, you know, have they been exposed to problematic content? And a little bit about what they're, they're posting. You know, sometimes we have kids that their parents have recognized that there is a problem because a friend of a friend has said, your kid is posting about some real serious concerns and that has led to some awareness. And sometimes we find that kids are admitted and the families are then looking into their social media, um, you know, posts and find out a lot of concerning, you know, um, behaviors and, um, and difficulties. So I think the idea is to be aware that this is happening and be thorough in our assessments. Uh, we have to, you know, really educate as clinicians on the importance of sleep, the stages of sleep, sleep deprivation, deprivation and the effects on mental health, the compulsive nature of social media, um, and that even one hour of blue light emission later to bed, by bedtime, it can really impact 
um, how, um, how the quality of sleep. We have to educate kids that their REM sleep is very, very crucial for their brain development and their physical development. And if they start to sleep later, their sleep latency, that means how later they, how, how uh, when they get to their, um, you know, REM sleep, the, the, the healthier amount of sleep takes longer. And because they are missing out on the earlier amount of sleep as the, as the night progresses, you get longer periods of um, better sleep, quality of sleep, which is the REM sleep for, for growth purposes. Uh, but you're missing out on the longer periods of REM sleep. So just basically the bottom line is sleep is extremely important for adolescent brain development. It is important for all of us, but it's especially important when you're growing and resetting and you know rewiring your brain and learning. And that's something that kids um, are missing out of and has tremendous effects on focus, attention, concentration, and such. Um, when kids are ready to, for example, you know, leave uh, Silver Hill and are able to go into community-based settings, we do a lot of work to try to educate them, um, to have them know how social use affects mental health, to recognize and be aware of the benefits, uh, to agree to build responsible use gradually, not to immediately go and have everything on, but really to negotiate with the families in terms of what is important and what is not important, and to discuss the impact of social media and relationships, again, education and sleep hygiene, and encourage physical activity, play, and time in nature. Basically, the bottom line is that we ask them to, let's keep the good things going when you first leave and not jump into everything else that contributed possibly to your um, worsening mental health. For teenagers, um, you know, we teach them to reach out for help, to try to create boundaries, to balance offline and online activities, and to develop protective strategies. For example, tracking the amount of time that they're using, blocking unwanted content, content learning about using uh, privacy setting settings, and to be to be brutal and say, you know, this is not healthy for me. I feel like I'm getting triggered. I'm just going to avoid it, to begin recognizing that, because we don't just want to say no, we just want to teach them and graduate them to have those skills. So this is the grandma's test. We try to teach the kids, be aware of what you share. If you wouldn't be proud of your grandmother um, seeing what you share, then maybe don't. Um, and then for families, about 70% of parents say that uh, it's become more difficult to parent than it than over the last 20 years in large part due to technology and social media. So for families, we need to try to help them create a family media plan, uh, like what areas is okay to use phones. Um, parents need to also manage their use, increase awareness. Don't assume that kids and parents um, know how to monitor online behavior. Help parents recognize the importance of helping their teens become full digital citizens. And that includes several aspects, deciding on age, we wouldn't give a person, you turn 16, here's the, the car keys. There are, is a graduated process. So in the same way, we have to help them set up contracts, um, especially if they have different household. If, you know, in the case that I discussed, if they're sometimes in mother's house and sometimes at dad's house, you know, how is that going to be managed? They need to be consistent. Um, which platforms they're going to use and what accounts are created because sometimes kids create this fake accounts like Finsta, for example, which is, you know, um, Instagram, but you know, fake account where they are not being their true selves, but they're presenting their best or worst versions of themselves. And that can sometimes create some difficulties in terms of how they're feeling uh, and what they're presenting to the world. And also it is important for families to be aware that, you know, that there could be a lot of other things that is not they're not aware of. So based on the age of the kids, sometimes uh, making sure that the parents have their password, being very clear on time allowances, scheduled breaks, et cetera, deleting applications if they are um, problematic. And that doesn't mean that they may not go on it on a computer and so forth, but to really be able to check, spot check and so forth. And also very importantly, how to say no, how to block people that are contributing, that are, that are either bullying, that are creating some uh, problematic um, feelings for the individuals, especially because there are some kids that just get overwhelmed and then they start getting into arguments with people that are trolling or that are strangers or uh, obsessively following um, certain things. And if it starts affecting their mental health, they need to be able to say no to that. In terms of this, this is uh, DQ In Institute. It's a, a think tank that is uh, worldwide invested in teaching individuals to have um, 
the components that they need to successfully become full, fully um, aware of everything online and everything digitalized. Um, and they take a worldwide approach into, into what they call DQ, which is instead of IQ, which is intelligence, or EQ, which is emotional intelligence, they, de they de uh, describe it as DQ, which is digital intelligence. And they have different modules and different ways that they monitor uh, worldwide where, where people find out what is their DQ. Are they able to, for example, have good digital citizen identity, for example, manage a healthy identity between what they're doing online and what they're doing offline with integrity. Screen management, for example, manage screen time, multitasking, one engagement with online behavior, social media, are they able to have self-control? Are they able to manage cyberbullying, detecting cyberbullying situation and handle them wisely? Are they able to protect data, creating strong password, manage cyber attacks, spam, scams, phishing, things like that? Manage privacy, so are they able to handle with discretion not only their information, but not repost things that involve being problematic to other people and other people's privacy? Are they able to use critical thinking, distinguishing between true and false information, good and harmful content, things that are trustworthy or, or, or objectionable? Digital footprint, which is to understand that the things that kids are posting right now might affect them later down the line and that nothing can become private. Even if they've posted something and they delete it immediately, that somebody could take a picture and that could become something that might affect them in their future and have consequences with their real life, you know, social, financial, and academic. There are kids that have been rejected, you know, um, from colleges after being accepted because of the objectional level of content. So that is really important. And digital empathy, which is the ability to understand that screens may feel like a safe, but there's still another individual or other individuals at the other end of the screen and their feelings and their state and their the kindness matters in that regard. So the idea for teenagers is not to say, no screen time or all the screen time in the world is just how are we going to graduate them so that they can become, become uh, good digital citizens. And that's the role for, that everybody, parents, educators, uh, teenagers themselves, clinicians and such have at stake. Um, so for schools and professional organizations, I think they can continue to provide resources and advocacy, parent teachers, organizations to try to establish community norms and guidelines and provide education. Kids feel like everybody's using the in a particular way, but I think if parents can get together and say, look, in our house, this is what we do in our community, this is what we want to, I think delaying and actually following through with the recommended times of starting social media, because let's face it, you know, a lot of social media sites expect that kids are going to be 13 and up, but in reality, there are kids, you know, younger, as young as eight and older that, um, you know, that are using uh, social media you know, fairly consistently. So I think that being aware of that um, and providing education and support is really helpful. Um, building centers for excellence, you know, that continue to advocate, give information and supports, definitely school funding. Uh, there are several curricula that are helpful, including one called Epidemic of Loneliness Connections uh, curricula that is part of, you know, some of the CDC and DASH that would be really wonderful to be, you know, applied. Um, and also um, improving school-based healthcare because not only it teaches with um, awareness of mental health challenges, but it also can help with individuals that are feeling marginalized, especially LGBTQ plus community, uh, and teaching them, you know, really good skills so that they can prevent some of the dating violence and manage some of their um, emotions and how to ask for help, especially if they don't feel as connected as they would at home. Um, there are those um, that might be in a position to advocate, I think that to try to hold social media platforms accountable in monitoring use is going to be important, rather than wait until somebody has found objectionable content and protested, uh, I think that people need to be able to, you know, to continue using algorithms, buzzwords and phrases to monitor what might be inappropriate content. Um, also, um, it is not usual for kids that are struggling with suicidality to necessarily post that they're feeling suicidal or want to hurt themselves, but it happens on occasion to really immediately uh, show and signpost to those individuals that they should call, you know, um, for help. Um, you know, social media companies also, I mean, could highlight when photos have been digitally manipulated to help people that are struggling with body image 
both girls and boys. I mentioned one particular uh, example of a, of a teen girl, but also boys are experiencing a lot of pressure to bulk up and build up and, and, and you know, um, have more muscles and so forth. And that's something that we notice in clinical examples. Um, to have things like pop-up notifications when, you know, there's heavy usage that's detected. Um, and um, definitely more research funding to understand the effects on the pandemic on teens, increased social media use, and overall, we need longer, better studies to show um, who is being affected and how to help them more specifically, not just general uh, education, but specific um, support strategies. For future research, we'll need more research in terms of connection with depression and suicide prevention. Um, and also to know what things specifically help or, or hinder, for example, the age, the gender, uh, the level of parental involvement, and what other factors make it more difficult, you know, educational attainment, family environment, ethnicity, and so forth to uh, manage social media use. I'm going to point that to some resources, um, some of the resources. I really like this one. It's Jean Twenge have this book, th this book, iGen, is based on some of her research. Um, and I just recommend uh, it, um, you know, just it, it's, a, it's a really great sociological study, which looks at, you know, across sections, uh, you know, through different um, decades uh, and will help us understand even before the pandemic where kids are actually having less rebelliousness, less um, experimentation socially, less willingness or interest in driving and things of that nature. Uh, but also are struggling with a lot more anxiety and a lot more depression. So it's really important, an important read. Uh, the Screenagers documentary series, I know that a lot of schools will have, an okay, and, and libraries and so forth will occasionally have a presentation and they usually are uh, moderated by usually a mental health expert. Um, I think the second one of the Screenagers, the youth mental health in the digital age has a lot of, you know, examples and agree and contracts and agreements. So that's a really great, um, you know, piece of information for parents and, and, and so forth. But again, you cannot just go and rent that, this or view it. You just have to wait until a school or a library near you has one of these screenings to really, um, you know, understand it because it merits a discussion. It's not just uh, useful just to, to view it. Another one is I mentioned a little bit about DQ Institute, um, and I'm not going to delve on it, uh, delve on it, but it really it has a lot of helpful information about balanced, healthy, and civic use of technology, uh, not just for teenagers or, or kids, but also in other ways that um, that are um, helpful as a as, as a view uh, as a, um, as basically as looking at best practices throughout the world and trying to combine what different organizations and have some standards that in the digitized society would be really helpful for many um, societies to, to adhere to. Um, this is a little bit more of an um, exploration on that, so I'm not going to get into details, but that's basically the previous slide was a little bit more simplified. This is a little bit more, um, more explorative, uh, more exposed rather, and I feel uh, there are a couple of other things. The American Academy of Child Adolescent Psychiatry has great facts for families. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a family resource center. Child Mind Institute has um, in the family resource center some, um, some great articles on screen time and technology section. The NIH also publish a healthy social media habits, um, how you use it in your matter. That's a flyer and those things can be easily accessible. So in conclusion, we don't clearly understand the relationship between social media and mental health concern. We do know clearly that it affects particularly uh, teenage girls, particularly some kids in different ethnic groups, and also the LGBT um, community tends to be more affected. We certainly know that the increase in use is highly correlated with more problems, but also that's defined based on how early the kid is exposed to that. And there's a lot more that needs to be um, you know, looked at. And yet we don't have the specifics of how the pandemic has altered these, um, you know, this landscape. We certainly, you know, believe based on how mental health has worsened it, that certainly those are concerns, particularly how much time kids spent with, um, you know, with an educational lag, perhaps. There are some kids that did well during the pandemic uh, in terms of the ones that were more anxious, anxious or able to work effectively online. There are some that really were just not able to do that. So I think it's really important to understand those factors better as we continue to move 
away from, um, you know, from, from the pandemic. Um, so here are some references. And at this point, I would like to take some of your questions. Wow, that, that was a tremendous presentation. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. So much information um, from someone who, who lives with this every day um, and, and understands it. Uh, we have a lot of questions that have uh, come up in the uh, Q&A. So, so please, everybody, go ahead and post any further questions that you have. I have a um, couple just to, to start us off. And, and I'm wondering, Liz, do you have a sense about kind of a, a, a best practice for a parent in terms of introducing kids to social media in terms of like what age uh, you would kind of give a, a cell phone and what age you, or you'd introduce and which platforms. I, I, I'm just kind of curious about that. So yes, I think that there are some guidelines and Child Mind Institute has a great guideline in terms of, you know, what, how would you tell that your child is mature enough to be able to begin using social media and so forth. The recommendation for the American Academy of Pediatrics is no screen use before the age of two. They're, they're having some flexibility. They say that it's okay if you're doing, for example, FaceTiming your grandparents, you know, or saying goodnight to your dad if they're across the world, that that might be an acceptable use of technology for individuals that are younger. Uh, but the idea is delay as much as you possibly can. When we're looking at the 12 and up and, and the, and the tw I'm sorry, the eight and up and the, and the tweens, uh, I think it's really, really important to just look at, um, you know, doing it with the least amount of time possible and really monitoring. Sometimes it's about sitting or sharing the information. I mean, YouTube is considered social media. So sitting and watching with their kids is going to be important and to gauge it in terms of what they need. So all kids are different. There are some kids that are much able to handle the content. So as long as parents are able to limit the total amount, be able to be aware of what is going on and monitor how the kids react. If the kid is, is then preoccupied with something that they're seeing or very imitative in their behavior, imitating a lot, or their sleep is affected, if that's all they want to do, that's a time to step back. It's also really important to, again, you know, look at their own um, use and their standards that they're creating and create some screen-free time zones um, to make sure that they are monitoring that. So there's not a, a specific age, but ideally social media, nothing be, be before the age of 13. And if you can wait a little longer, that would be ideal. Right. I, I was interested too, I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of loneliness in general and saw that um, you had a mention about that curriculum. And it, it sounds like there's maybe some mi mixed evidence out there that on, in some way, social media allows people to feel more connected potentially. Um, but I, I do know that at least in um, some adult studies that excess of use um, leads to a greater sense of subjective loneliness. Is that true in adolescence also in addition to depression? Is it kind of mediated by loneliness? I believe so. And uh, again, we don't have very clear data, but there are some individuals that seem to get more connected. The ones that feel that benefit from the social media uh, in managing loneliness are particularly the LGBTQ plus community and kids from different ethnicities where they see themselves as connected if they find something uh, that they can connect with individuals all over the world um, that, that can be really um, helpful. The ones that are more distraught by it are the ones that are uh, using it and they have this fear of missing out or they have this investment, but it's with individuals that they are almost in, in a much more dramatic fashion. So we find again, LGBTQ plus um, individuals, they actually have a sense of better uh, connectedness. Great, um, Shannon Wargo writes in um, with a question, how much of the data about increased depression in teens could be due to COVID uh, in 2021 and not necessarily social media alone? I'm remembering you told us that like the second year of the pandemic, there was a greater presentations around inpatient admissions and suicidality and depression. Um, could that be from the isolation and from COVID versus social media or do we know that? Yeah, so it's it's hard to tell. So we need more studies with that. But some of the studies that we have noted 
have noted an increase on kids that were looked at at a particular study, the one in, in San Francisco, and they were looking at before the pandemic and after the pandemic. The kids before the pandemic were struggling, but their struggles were much more magnified after you know, the pandemic, particularly, um, you know, and then we saw the increases in presentations to the emergency department. So again, the mental health struggles for teenagers has been building up and magnifying. And I think the pandemic you know, just just brought up more of the mental health concerns. So we still don't have a clear relationship. But we what we do understand is that throughout the generation, the kids that are exposed to social media right now are struggling in a variety of ways, much more than the kids before social media uh, you know, was uh, prevalent in various ways, including higher rates of depression, higher rates of anxiety, increase in the in suicidality, and so forth. So, okay. absolutely, there is you know some concern about that, and it's not not only mediated by social media, but that that tends to be something that we need to seems to look some to be something that we need to look into further. Great, thank you, uh, Sandy Lair. Um, writes in that uh, studies have indicated that movement in terms of exercise and, and breath work um, treat mild, moderate depression and anxiety. And so I was wondering your thoughts about the increase of screen use actually limiting physical activity and changing neurochemistry that way, um, just from the immobility associated with potentially gaming and, and social media. Absolutely. And some of the studies, some of the concerns particularly indicate that I didn't get into that in detail, but there is the kids that have high uh, social media use in some studies have higher uh, rates of obesity, decreased in, uh, activities, including, um, you know, after school sports and other things of that nature. So there's a clear correlation of increased use of screens, not only for social media, but screens for gaming and other things like that, and less um, movement, et cetera. And so I think that that's, that's an important, you know, association and one that when the kids are ready to go home, we encourage them to stay active, to stay physically, you know, movement and in, in movement and so forth. Um, there are some beneficial effects, um, you know, the, these are the same kinds of things that will help anybody, but will help individuals when they are depressed, good sleep, you know, adequate nutrition, and some degree of gentle um, movement, movement at the very least, is tremendously, um, you know, beneficial. Fantastic. Um, there's so much gratitude. I can't really characterize it from all of the question, the chats coming in. And, and uh, in addition to that, and you may have mentioned this in the the resource section at the end. There's questions about: Do you have a recommendation about um, the best resource for adolescents themselves uh, about tr about training? Um, and um, kind of developing resilience amidst social media? I think that there are some specific uh, resources. Um, I like one of the ones that I didn't mention is called You Matter, the letter U, mm. and the words matter, which is kids respond to content that's been created by teenagers for teenagers, but that's been curated by experts. So the, um, the other one, which I think it's in the, in the research is, I mean, in the slides is, a, forget right now which particular center, but it's listed there um, that it is for kids by kids. And I think that that sharing that information with teenagers themselves can be um, helpful. Uh, there are some links also in some of the monitoring the future studies um, for teenagers resources, um, you know, themselves. Um, and I listed in, in, in the in the slides again, some of the some of the things that can be discussed with the teenagers, so the the things that they can do themselves. Because the whole point is to have them become better digital citizens. Also, DQ has even some tests that kids can take to learn what their digital quotient is, and they 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 hmm. prepare it. So if a kid that scores at an eighty five percent instead of um, you know one hundred percent, they're actually more likely to be exposed to uh, more negative content or more likely to be involved in bullying or other inappropriate things. So you can have kids as early as eight, you know, take a little quiz online to see what is their level of awareness. And they ask simple questions like, you know, how do you set your passwords? You know, not what the password is, but necessarily, you know, do you put your birthday? Do you share particular information with your friends to kind of see where the kids are? So having kids take that test and say like, wow, I didn't realize that, but I'm, you know, I'm at higher risk of being um, scammed or other things that of that nature can be helpful. Great. Uh, Casey Peck uh, puts 
puts in the chat uh, the general idea that often kids can get in trouble for posting race, racist ideas and thoughts on social media. Do you have experience with that or wisdom to share about that? Well, I think it's problematic. And I think that, you know, uh, kids need to be aware that, you know, it is it is a concern. Uh, it is a concern for the individuals that, that view it about, you know, 16% of African-American girls um, see um, negative posts online that are, you know, racist. I think that uh, school districts are becoming really good at no tolerance when, when that information is, they, they become aware of that information. So I think that really is a, a point of, you know, educating individuals. And I think just to let them know that these things carry forward. There are some, there's some kids that think that they are, uh, that, that, that that sometimes they are involved, engaged in racist activities, but a lot of times it's just a bad joke turned into something that individuals take very seriously and kids can have tremendous consequences. So it's education, education, education at, a, at, a, at an earlier and later stage. And just thereafter, if there's been a negative occurrence and the person really wants to yeah, um, do something different, they just need to be very aware thereafter of what they're posting and line and persona and, and everything else. Um, involves. Fantastic. Richard Francis uh, puts out, says tour de force, um, and, and also asks you the questions, how can grandparents help? That is really wonderful. I think that grandparents can get involved just as well as parents to support their children and their grandchildren on understanding social media. I think grandparents are not giving enough credits because they have lived through all of the changes. So there is still some value to saying, in my day, you know, we first, you know, finished homework and went for a bike ride and met all the kids in the, in the neighborhood to, to transmitting some of the values that are really important to really understand what is important as a family because kids are getting a lot of their values. This is time, teenagers are time to re-examine relationships and values that have been handed down by their parents, but they are exposed to a bigger um, you know, a bigger community. So just making sure that those standards are passed on relating to kindness, relating to social interaction and the importance of that. Of that. Uh, make sure that when the kids are visiting, for example, that that's a tech-free zone, that you really are focused on the interaction during family gathering and to get the younger kids away from the cell phone as a babysitter and say, hey, you know, how's your day going? How's the school going? And things like that. So grandparents have a special role because parents have to do a lot of policing. So grandparents can come in and be the nice guys and kind of really just, um, you know, just chill. Fantastic. Fantastic. I love that. So Elizabeth Peralta sends in a question. Uh, what are the best apps parents can use to monitor their kids' use of screen time mm -hmm. and what they're actually using? And then a follow-up to that, what are your thoughts on parents snooping? Yeah. Um, so I know that a lot of parents like to use Disney Plus. Um, you know, there are, you know, other varieties of it. So I think this is beyond the scope. I didn't want to get into technical mm. because I don't want to make specific recommendations. So I'm just going to move away from that. Um, but I think that the bottom line is that there's graduated exposure that you can actually select some of the times when the kid can use, for example, a phone. Um, you know, set up some particular times for bedtime, really work on the blue light so the kids are not exposed to the bright blue light that affects their sleep too late in the daytime and so forth. And then be able to hand that that over as the teenagers get older to give that, that um, you know, that ownership to kids in a more graduated way. Um, and in terms of the other part of the question, if, I, if you don't mind um, reminding me again. Um, yeah, for parents about parents snooping or, or oh, yes looking very very them. important mm -hmm. we don't recommend parents snooping i think that really if parents feel very um compelled to put in an app that tracks keywords that the kids could be texting or disclosing in social media because so they're worried that the kids tend to for provocative matter ways and other things like that post about self-harm or suicidality or things like that, or, or, or teenagers, there are some apps that will do that. Mm -hmm. And my recommendation is that if they're going to be doing that, it is better to tell the kids, hey, we feel like we need to do something like this. So we're putting this app and this is what's going to be due. So the app itself becomes a deterrent because mm -hmm. sometimes when the parents then find other information about it, then they don't have the wherewithal to be able to share it with the kids. 
And that's what we do here clinically. Let's say, for example, we hear that a kid is here in treatment and the parents found some terrible information of what the kid is doing online. So we say to them, we're not going to just out of the thin air necessarily start helping the kid understand the ramifications of what is going on, but we need to let them know that you're sharing this with us. Is it, is it okay if we share with the kid that information or better yet, can we have a conversation all together into, yeah, your parents became aware of this. They're very concerned how we're going to address it from this point on. And I know we have the luxury of having the kids and the parents not in the same room where things can escalate in the moment, but I think the goal is to um, try to avoid, and we do that whether it's you know reading journals or things of that nature. The only thing that I have to say, the only caveat that I have to say is that if you're very, very concerned, your kid is making an attempt, suicide attempt or something of that nature, all bets are off. And I think that, you know, you first read and get the information and ask permission after. So I think that there will be instances where, you know, um, it's important to just, you know, break that confidentiality and immediately go to repair it because their life is at stake. But beyond that, it's if it's a matter of setting up standards, it's important to say, I'm worried about you. We're starting, you know, this process where this is what, what's going to be found. And kids can get even sneakier. It can happen, but at the same time, it can be a deterrent and, and really a reinforcement to post more appropriate behavior and content. Thank you. Thank you. Another great question coming in. Um, are there any particular guidelines for individuals on the with autism spectrum as they are so easily? influenced and take a lot at face value. Yes, I think that it is it is very concerning. And um, we do see that a lot of kids that are on the spectrum tend to struggle more with, you know, with black and white thinking and some level of concreteness. And they may struggle more with the content and not being able to validate that. So I think that for individuals that are on the spectrum, again, especially with, you know, they, they get so fascinated with the gaming and the world and the, the one focus, one track man, mind. And I think that for them, the idea is to be very clear on the limits. The limits need to be black and white, written contract and agreement, and be very thorough in terms of, um, yes, you know, you spend more time than you were. So to no more electronics tomorrow and be real clear on the consequences that helps kids maintain the boundaries, because I think that the tech use tends to be more problematic overall, if you don't set up even more black and white boundaries with kids that are on the spectrum. And in terms of content, I think that just to teach them and be aware of what's right or wrong. A lot of kids on the spectrum tend to have a bigger sense of uh, right and wrong morality. So just teaching them what's right and what's wrong, and then continue having the discussions with them. And the other piece is that to make sure that they're having a lot of non-screen social time. And a lot of those times will be adult supervised activities, hobbies, activities, scouting, things like that, that involves other adults being around to make sure that the kid is able to understand the social nuance because they may not be able to get it through a screen. However, there are many kids that are on the spectrum that connect beautifully over uh, common things and, and themes and a particular type of games and activities and so forth. So it's a matter of regulating the amount, um, the use, understanding the content and be able to negotiate that with a little bit more, um, more balance. Great, we have only a few minutes left and the questions keep rolling on in. Um, you and I had talked that maybe for the questions we don't get to, we'll put together some kind of community uh, um, event where we can be guided by the questions. And so we will collect them and, and be back. Uh, so I'll end with this one from, from uh, Carol Knight who asked, what, what is the best response to bullying for teens when they're not in control of content about them that's being exposed? So I think that at that point, it takes um, you know support from other adults. I think that it's easier when the content is something, somebody that you can block and that's direct. Uh, the problem is that a lot of kids will not share bullying or will not talk about it. But the recommendation is if you can get them to start talking about it because it can, it can involve sometimes you know, police when pictures are being distributed that are completely inappropriate. It can involve the schools becoming aware and tracking technology. If, for example, you know, um, things are being said or sent that are destroying the person's reputation. So taking a step back and really taking a bigger approach and that's graduated based on the situation would be really helpful. But again, for teenagers, sometimes you say no or blocking a person that is being um, problematic or destructive is not sufficient. And so I think bringing it up and raising the alarm to parents, to individuals. And I know that it's handled on a case-by-case -case basis. We've had parents that have had to contact the police, 
have had to contact um, different schools, have had to contact the other individual's family, and it, it really can race or, or be a matter of, you know, it, it really depends on the, the intent, the, uh, the extent, and the circumstances. Fantastic. We are at one minute um, before the hour, so I just want to give you, Dr. Ortiz Schwartz, a huge thank you for, uh, as, as was mentioned, a tour de force presentation and your clinical wisdom and what you've uh, gleaned from the research and shared with us is just so important. And, and I so appreciate your being here with us today. If, again, if people are interested in continuing education credits um, after the presentation, a link will, will come to you. Please fill out the evaluation and we will get you the credits. And at the end of the presentation, which is now, we have all been involved in this wonderful presentation and we'll all be suddenly alone. So, um, so thank you all for joining and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.